Thank you so much. What a blessing. Um, man, um, <laughs> wow. Thank you, guys. You guys are amazing. I had a um, Wednesday was my birthday, and uh, I don't identify by age anymore. Not that age bothers me, right? <laughs> she said, amen. Um, but, but when I was in, out, in, when my wife and I were in North Carolina in February, uh, I heard uh, Pastor Whitfield was talking to somebody who told him, said, we are actually moving to various levels as we move up. So I'm at level 57. I like the way that sounds better. 57 years old. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I'm going to get, Melanie, I'm going to get you next Sunday. Can we do that? Or next Saturday. Melanie, Melanie, Dr. Melanie King, wave your hand, darling. Dr. Melanie King sent us a testimony this week for sake of time. I'm going to get it from her next Sunday. I mean, Saturday. Next Saturday. Saturday. We won't be here next Sunday. Um, but, uh, huh? 5 p.m., yes, indeed. But uh, what a blessing. What a blessing. Tremendous. God is using and blessing her and many of you in tremendous, tremendous ways. Where's Susan at? Susan came here without a walker and without a cane. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And, and many of you, you know, uh, I'm delighted that the word is working in your life because if it's not, then you're probably in the wrong place or you're not applying it. You know, I would rather think that you're just not applying it, but it, it does work. Amen. The word of God does work. Boy, I'm excited. I really am. Um, glory to God. So is my grandson. Uh, on, on Wednesday, I started to say my birthday was Wednesday and Dominic. How many of you know Dominic, my, net, my, my grandson? We were there and we were just kind of having a, a, a birthday meal and balloons were present. Well, Dominic is... Not quite three. So, so he walks up to me and he says, Papa, it's your birthday? And he's at that stage where he keeps saying, why? Why? Every, um, why? You can say why all you want and explain and think you're, why? So he, he, said, he said to me, he said, then he said, why, Papa? He said, I want a birthday. And so we turned that my birthday into his birthday. <laughs> and boy, he had, are these my balloons now? <laughs> uh, but the, the joy of a child and their innocence is what Jesus came to make all of us be aware of. Amen. And uh, so it was a delight and we were blessed. And I, I, did go out, I did go out catching in the frigid weather of Wednesday. And I'm delighted to say I didn't come up empty handed. Didn't catch all I wanted, but I caught something. Amen. And so many times you may not get all you want, but you should be getting something from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray and we'll we'll see where the Lord takes us this morning. I got a couple of things in my heart, but I'm just going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, we welcome your presence in this place. How delighted we are that you make all of this a reality, not just myths, not just fables. Not just an unconscious effort, Lord God, to be somehow or another, you know, feel like we, we need something as a crutch, but rather we recognize your deity and your humanity and your love for us. And your word says that if Christ be not risen, then we of all people are most miserable indeed. But you are risen. You are real. You are alive. And we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And I'm a believer today, Father. I'm a believer that your presence is with me, the anointing of your great Holy Spirit, precious Spirit of God is upon me and in me that allows me to speak as an oracle of God so that your people are blessed, not for my own glorification or my own recognition. It is simply so that your people are blessed. Father, let them be empowered by the presence of your Spirit this morning. Come on, come on, come on. Let them be empowered this morning. Let them feast from the table of your presence, Lord. You have prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. So we, we intentionally pull ourselves up to the table. We get out our fork and knife, as it were, and we dig in to what your Holy Spirit has for us. So allow the ears of the hearer to be blessed and the eyes of the seer to see into the realm of the Spirit. Let all of us have a discerning heart to hear what thus saith the Lord as you lead us upon the journey of righteousness, one day culminating in our eternal resting place with you. Hallelujah. 
And we're so delighted and excited about that. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 As I stand before you, um, I've got a, a few things that were actually on my heart. And, and those of you that are consistent attendees here at LifePoint know that we've been talking about what? We've been talking about going from restoration to harvest. And as such, um, there's a lot in that. And it's not just, you know, I'm not just a uh, change message every week kind of guy. I just kind of allow the Holy Spirit to lead me and build upon what he's been talking about. Turn me, give me just a little bit of volume, please. So with that being said, um, I thought about it. And next, next Friday, we will be having our Seder dinner, right? And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then next Saturday at 5 p.m., we will have our resurrection service. The reason why we're having service on Saturday, it's not a spiritual reality. It's just they have a Sunday brunch here on, on uh, Easter Sunday, what they call Easter, we call resurrection. Amen. So as such, we will be displaced. But I hope you'll make time, if you're able, to come be with us on next Saturday evening at 5 p.m. Amen. I am, I am always, um, as are you, as are you, I'm always curious about um, things that I don't have a handle on. Um, it's easy in Christianity, how many Christians we got in here today? It's easy in Christianity to somehow or another get into this lulled state or false sense of security where we think that all we have to do is get born again and everything else takes care of itself. Yeah. And with God, I, I don't see anywhere in his word where that is the case. Rather, I see things that seem to be about God that almost take on a combative nature. And I'm always surprised when people of God say things to me or to my wife or to you, I don't like to fight. And yet this battle of, of our lives, because that's what it is, is not a war. Help me somebody. The war has been won, and we typically call it spiritual warfare, and I get it, I understand, that's what we've been trained, but rather we need to condense things down to a battle, if not, not every year, how about just every month or every day? Because every day we're battling for the reality of who God called Calls us. Calls us. I don't know about you, but many times I feel like I am less than, I am less than uh, who God called me to be. Uh, yeah. Glory to God. I think I've got microphone gloves. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Give me a hand. So with that being said, what happens is with God, <laughs> what we have to do is we have to be cognizant of the fact or the reality. God is always consistently, say consistently, consistently moving and doing things on our behalf. Always. There's never a time when God forgets who you are. God does not qualify his love for you based on your current reality. If I use the bells, and I do frequently because they sit on the front row, and as long as they sit on the front row, I will always use them. Amen. <laughs> but their they're, 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 um, acknowledgement or Existence in God is not based on the fact that they are both ordained elders under this ministry. Very has, really has very little to do with anything. God's, God's love for me or his reality and how he treats me is not based on because I'm a shepherd. But it's based on because I acknowledge who his son is in my life. And as long as I call Jesus Lord and do the things that Jesus has called me to do, God will always be moving for my success, no matter how much I feel like I have, have or have not accomplished in him. Stay with me now. Come on. What that does, it destroys the myth that people somehow or another are only pleasing to God when they're born again. Help me, God. I was pleasing to God before I knew him. I just was not saved. There's a difference. Because until I get saved, I can be pleasing to God doing things. My wife and I, you know, those, most, most of you know our struggle. For the first eight and a half years in our, of our married life, we were headed for disaster. But God still loved me because the Bible says that for God so loved the Christian. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That what? Whosoever. 
And so in my, in my current situation at that time, what I did not know is that I needed to take the, take the plunge, as it were, and leap into salvation. Amen. And once, once I get born again, then the pleasing doesn't stop, but rather it escalates to the point where I can now all of a sudden begin to hear his voice and do his will at such a level that whoever encounters me encounters the living God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So what we, uh, as, as we're under attack in the battle, say the battle, yeah. as we're under attack, what happens is the devil's, devil's counterattack and his agents are constantly reminding us of who we used to be, yes. what we used to do, how many ladies we slept with, how many guys we slept with, how many lies we told, how many things we stole, how many times we did not do what was pleasing to God. But God is not the author of confusion, and nor is he the author of your past. Matter of fact, he is the author and finisher of our faith. So with that being said, I want us to get a conscious thought in our, in our thinking. What if... You and I today, sitting here today, knew that we only had one week to live. If you, could, if you could condense it down to the very moment, the very hour, the very very minute of your departure, your death. I, I know people don't like to hear the word death because it kind of shocks them into reality. But, but unless the Lord delays his coming, each one of us is going to go by the way of the grave. <laughs> I, I, you know, I know it's not the appointment that we look forward to. I know it's, it is his life. It's not the appointment that we, we somehow or another, we try to avoid it at any cost, all costs. Anything I can do, if I can make this heart better, if I can make these lungs better, if I can make, you know, my blood system better, if I can make my body more physically sound, if I can work on this mind and stave off dementia and Alzheimer's and all these things, if I can somehow or another grasp onto the, the very fabric and fiber of why I'm here, but you are not here to live forever, you are here to do the will of him who sent you. And so we move into this realm now, and you say, well, you know, I don't know when I'm going to die. You're right, you don't. But the Bible doesn't say that you have a time to die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. So in other words, and I'm not going to get too, too far into that, but in other words, we've all been born for the same reason in many respects that Jesus was born. Jesus was born to die. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that he was the lamb that was slain before what? The very foundation of the world. So what I want to do, do is I want to take you through, uh, you know, I'm just titling this your, your last week alive, but, but we're going to use the life of Jesus as our benchmark. Can we do that? And let's, let's just see where the Holy Spirit takes us. I, I didn't, this wasn't what I studied, you know, during the course of the week. This is just something the Lord laid on my heart. And so I'm going to go through it and, and discover and, and, and dig deep into the truths of God's word. I invite you to get something to write with because we got a lot of scriptures here. Let's just see how many can we can get to. And I want you to take some good notes and we'll go from there. Amen. So we're a week out. We're a week out, right? Uh, uh, it, it, according to our current calendar, next Sunday will be the day that we celebrate the resurrection. Many people call it Easter, which is really a pagan holiday. But so around here we call it resurrection. But I'm not, you know, don't, don't feel bad if you call it Easter. It's the same thing, resurrection. But we're a week out. What, what would you do? What would you be doing if you knew you were one week, within one week of dying? What would you be doing? Come on out. Don't, don't turn your thinking caps off. What, what would you do? What would you be doing? Going to see family. Going to see family. Evangelize. Evangelize. We get real spiritual when we know the day is coming. <laughs> right? I'm, no, I'm, I'm not being funny. with. I'm serious. We get real deep when we know the day is coming. But why don't we get deep? And it really would seem like from an introspective standpoint, it would seem like we would get more zealous and more eager to do this when we don't know what day it's coming. See, because no man knows the day or the hour, not just of the Lord's return, but of your departure from this earth. And so every moment of every 
every every day is significant. And, and sadly, many times all you hear is people who are maybe have a terminal disease and they realize maybe they've got a platform or whatever, and they realize that their 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 finality or their their what's the word I'm looking for, their their um, mortality is is no longer under their control. And so then they become real and real uh, uh, aware and very deep, as it were. Right? Am I right about it? And what happens is, you know, th what God calls us to do is not necessarily be deep at the time of our departure, but to be deep, using that word in quotations, every moment of every day because somebody's life may depend on whether or not you tell them about Jesus. Isn't that right? So let's look at a couple things here. Let's, let's look at, let's look at uh, Saturday and Sunday. With Saturday being the original and genuine Sabbath. Y'all know that, amen? So with Saturday and Sunday, let's look at what Jesus was doing. The Bible says, uh, matter of fact, uh, turn with me. I want to invite you to turn here. I don't want to leave you in, in, in the dark. John 11 and 55. Can you put it up on the board, please? John 11, 55. If you don't have a Bible, they, again, got scriptures to be going up in just a moment. Because I have to believe that Jesus, now, how many of you would agree with me that Jesus knew when he was going to die? Yeah, he did. He did. Those of you that don't agree with me will continue to pray for you. Amen? The Bible says, I'm reading from the Expanded Bible, it was almost time for the Passover feast or the Passover of the, Passover of the Jews, the annual festival that celebrates God's rescue of Israel from Egypt. What was Jesus? This is more like a, a, a teaching session. Jesus was our what? What lamb? Passover lamb. So what Jesus is celebrating is what he is. Right? He's getting ready to make a... Um, sacrifice of his own life John 12 you don't have to turn there says that he says he says except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone but if it dies it brings forth what much fruit so here it says it says um, many from the country went up to Jerusalem before the Passover to do the special things to make themselves what pure or to consecrate themselves right that's that's 1155 so on on the first thing that we see Jesus doing is he comes and he draws near to Jerusalem. He arrives at Bethany, Bethany, excuse me, six days before Passover. Do you see that? So we've already moved into six days out and Jesus is doing something specific. So I want you to turn with me, turn with me to John 12 and 1. Just my, my Bible's the next page, right? Are you there? Can you say amen? It says, therefore, six days before the Passover feast, Jesus went to Bethany, where Lazarus lived. Lazarus is the man that Jesus raised from the dead. We know that. So we see a deliberate attempt on Jesus' part to prepare himself for his sacrifice, or can I say it this way, his death. He's, <laughs> I don't mean to be. Here at LifePoint, we like to have fun, so forgive me if I offend your, your fun meter. <laughs> but I doubt very seriously that if Jesus had Netflix, he'd be watching it. <laughs> it, it just doesn't seem logical to me that if Jesus had an opportunity to, to be on Facebook or go to Bethany, that he would choose Facebook over Bethany. Because he knows he's on, now he's in day six. See, it's one thing to know that you got seven days. No, no, no. Now, to be clear, these days are guaranteed for you. You don't, you don't, you know, it's not like, well, you know, I could go at any moment. Y'all hear me now this morning. It's not that he's just going to go any moment. He knows how much time he has. So he knows that he's not going to go in day six of seven. It makes a difference. It makes a difference to his approach. It should make a difference to our approach, knowing that we do not have the ability to control the time of our departure. Right? Okay, so in day six, he moves now, and he's, he's now entered where? Where's he gone into? Bethany. So in Bethany, here what he's doing is he's, he's doing the same thing he was doing before. He's making preparations. So uh, on Saturday, Jesus was anointed 
at Simon the leper's house. Now, I want you to turn with me to John, uh, excuse me, turn to uh, Matthew 26. And the reason why I want you to see the scripture is because I want you to know that I'm not making this stuff up. Is that all right? Okay. Matthew 26 and verse 6. If you have it, say amen. Thank you, Father. Still hear some pages turning. Thank you. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, who had a skin disease. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Wait a minute. Let, no, let me keep reading. Okay. He was a leper. Say he was a leper. He was a leper. Simon may have been healed by Jesus, but Clearly, the scripture does not say that, but while Jesus was there, I'm reading verse 7, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar, we know that one very well, filled with expensive perfume. She poured this perfume on Jesus' head while he was eating. All right? Let's keep reading. His followers or disciples were upset. They were indignant. Verse 8, I'm reading. When they saw the woman do this, they asked, why waste that perfume? It could have been sold, verse 9, for a great deal of money and the money given to the poor. My goodness, boy, what a waste, right? We, we know that portion of the scripture very well, but do we recognize that Jesus goes intentionally into the house of a leper? <sighs> Help me, God. Modern day leprosy is almost extinct. Would you agree with that? And Father, we come against this measles outbreak in the name of Jesus. With that being said, Jesus is intentional. Now, you can say that we know that John 14 says that I do nothing except that which I hear my father say and do. So the direction of him to be in Simon's house is at the leading of the Lord. But why is it that, that Jesus seeks out intentionally somebody who is ostracized by the rest of society? I better go over here because you ain't saying that. So, 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 so. Would if we were knowingly, intentionally trying to do the will of God before our departure, would we go down to? I don't think there's any Susie's in here, so I can use that word. I think any Susie, no, there's Susan. Let me back off that one. Any Nancy's in here, just to be clear. Any Nancy's, any Nancy's, raise your hand now. Now's your time of escaping, okay? Go down to Sister Nancy's house, and Sister Nancy is a hoe. Sister Nancy is kind of, you know, street walker. She's a lady of the night. Keep coming. I keep using them. You keep giving them to me. I use them. Sister Nancy is anybody's. And, 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 and yet, he doesn't reject Simon, but he seeks Simon out. Because Simon is one who, whether he had been previously healed or not, you knew and you know that the master is not going to leave Simon in the condition in which he currently resides. So, so, so my point is, if I go down to Sister Nancy's house, it is my obligation, God help me, knowing that I'm going to cross over in just a few short hours, I have to make sure that Sister Nancy is ready to meet the Lord. Right? So, so he's intentional. He's deliberate. He's not just kind of, I don't know what I'm called to do. The Bible says in the writing of John the Apostle, he says, for this cause was the Son of God manifested or shown to be in existence. That he what? Might destroy the works of the devil. Right? Okay, so we've moved into what day? What day we moved into? Did, we, did anybody still with me? Right. OK. OK. So we moved in. We're still on Saturday and Sunday. And now let's go to let's go to let's let's, let's turn. Y'all OK. Yeah. Let's go to John 12. Now what has happened? A, a, it's a Sunday and a great guy, a great crowd comes to Bethany to seek Jesus out. Hmm. Interesting. He's he's in the he's in the home of a, a leper. But now everybody's kind of, you know, and isn't it funny that before he went into the house, everybody was avoiding the house. John 12, verse 9 through 11. Did we read that? 9? Turn with, the, turn with me there, please. You all right? Okay, I just want to make sure, make sure, make sure. John 12, verse 9. I'm going to read down to verse 11. When you have to say amen. So here it says, a large crowd of people 
heard that Jesus was in Bethany. So they went there to see not only, listen, not only Jesus, but Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Isn't that interesting? Verse 10 says, so the leading priests made plans or plotted, counseled together to kill Lazarus too. Now, what's happening? Jesus is now taking himself, knowing that he has enemies in the, in the, in the community, does not stop him from showing up there. He goes to the community with an expectation not to be killed because he already knows he's going to die. So when you already know that you're going to die, there really is no fear of death. Rather, there is an intentionality and purpose of your death that causes you to find out what am I here for. Right. And, 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 and to me, I said this last week, you know, just, just, a, just a little break there. I said this last week, and I want to make sure you understand it. We're not called to live by the Bible as much as we are called to live the Bible. In other words, we are, we are, you know, one author says that we are written or living epistles, read of all men. In other words, my life is not so much a history book as it is a story book. God help me. In, in other words, I'm here to show that God is real to the community of Iowa City and Coralville and Tiffin and North Liberty. That's why I'm here. So what I've got to do is not hide behind my pastor title. I can't hide behind my church Sunday existence or my, the suit of clothes that I have on. I have to step out of this and step into the reality of why God called me here in the first place. And if he didn't call me here to change somebody's life, then I am wasting my mind and his time. Yeah. <sighs> okay, 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 all right. So a great crowd comes to Bethany to see Jesus. Now let's push on to Monday. Can we do that? Monday, say Monday. Monday. Turn with me to John 12. Verse 12. The next day, a great, somebody say, oh yeah, I'm right there. The next day, a great, I said that. The next day, a great crowd who had come to Jerusalem for the, what? Passover feast, which is the annual festival that celebrates God's rescue of Israel from Egypt. Y'all do know that, right? Write down Exodus 12 if you don't. Study it later. They heard that Jesus was coming there, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet Jesus shouting. Now, your Bible, if it's King James, probably says what? Hosanna, which is an Aramaic cry. Hosanna, or it means salvation, right? Now, look up at me. They have heard he is coming. Is this the first time he's been to Bethany? Why is it significant that they now begin to shout Hosanna? Come on, yeah, I know the answer to this. Because they have been taught that the king of the Jews would show up during the Passover feast. In other words, I'm excited when I hear that Christian is coming, but I'm not so much excited for Christians coming as the timing and the, the potential reason why he's coming. It's like this. John writes, the Apostle John writes, that we should look even more so to the coming of Jesus with such an expectation that even so we say unto the heavens, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So in other words, when we see the sign of the time and the sign of the age, we should be delighted that, oh my God, is he really coming today? So they start being drawn by their religious tradition. Religious tradition will never override spirit intuition. That's why it's important that we be spiritually in tuned rather than religiously inclined. I, I don't show up to church just because it's Sunday and this is what I do. I show up with an expectation that Alvin today might be the day. He might just come while we're in the middle of a church service. Help me some. So, so, so my point is that I want to be wherever his presence tells me to be. So they come, right? And they're there and they're kind of hanging out. I'm going to read it again. The next day, a great crowd who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, that's why they were there, heard that Jesus was coming there. 
And they're all excited. So Jesus enters into, into Jerusalem, right? And he does something which is spectacular to me. He visits the temple. Now, with that being said, turn with me to Matthew 21. Are y'all right? Yes. Matthew 21. We're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to do a little reading here, if that's okay. Even if it's not, y'all be all right. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. I hear you, sir. Matthew 21. Verse 1. Now, look up at me for a minute. Gentlemen, I really don't like this thing. I tell you, I'm part Italian. I grew up in New York. I got to be able to talk with my hands. <laughs> That's Jewish. Anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Y'all better lighten up, man. We have become so, God, where were we yesterday, darling? We were at a store. I won't mention the store because some of y'all might work there. Y'all might have stock in that store. Y'all might not appreciate me talking bad about your store. And it wasn't Walmart. Amen. I'm just saying. <laughs> See? It wasn't Walmart. Y'all know my affinity towards Walmart. But we were in a store yesterday, and there was, am I on? There was a store that we were in, and we saw. It's on. Testing one, two. Am I? Is that me? Yay, hallelujah. I can use my hands again. In the store that we're in, there was this creepy thing. And that creepy thing about weirded me out. And I'll say what y'all want to say. It had ears. Some of y'all finally starting to wait. Oh, okay. And a big head. And... A furry body and it just sat there doing this all the little kids came up and they just doing this and I thought to myself if I was six I wouldn't walk up on that thing I wouldn't I mean you know I ain't never been no scary person I grew up in the country so you really can't be scared of shadows and stuff when you live in the country because you out there in the country and stuff is always making noise right and so, anyway, I looked at that thing, I thought, you know what, I just want to walk up to it and lay hands on it suddenly. See, some of y'all thought I was going to say smack it, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't say that, y'all say that. But I wanted to just lay hands on it suddenly. But, but the Lord began to speak to me. He likes speaking to me in stores. Because what I saw was the attention that we have given as a society to the things that absolutely do not matter. We spend more time prepping for egg hunts and, 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 and baskets. Now, I must admit, I must admit, growing up in the church back in the day, back in the 60s and 70s, you know, I, I realized that, and even today, I'm not, pull your religious toes in now. They you get stepped on. I didn't warn you, okay? But, but with that, the, the baskets that we get and the little gifts and the little hats and bonnets and clothes that we get to celebrate, all that is great, but it is not the essential to what we need to be teaching our babies. We got so many people caught up in the ritual of Easter or resurrection that they've forgotten that the resurrection was an actual event that sealed my humanity into eternal existence because if the Bible says that if Christ had not risen, are you feeling me this morning? So, so, so I want to make sure that I turn my, my religious understanding of Easter and resurrection and because we celebrate it every year and he still has not come, there is coming a day, my God, that we don't know the day or the hour, only the Father knows that he might show up before we get to Easter or we might, he might show up before we get to Good Friday. You just don't know. So these people are here and they're just... They come because they know he's in town. Where did that was the last scripture I gave you? Where did I leave you at? What? Matthew 21, verse 1. As Jesus, his followers, were coming closer to Jerusalem, they stopped at Bethpage, or the Mount of Olives. From there, Jesus sent two of his followers and said to, or his disciples to them, go to the town. You can see there ahead of you. When you enter it, you will quickly, you hear that? immediately find a donkey tied there with its colt untie them bring them to me if anyone asks you why you are taking the donkeys say that the master 
or the Lord need, needs them. And he will send them at once, right? You see that. This was to bring about or fulfill what the prophet had said that had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the people of Jerusalem, right? Now, did these people know the prophecy? Absolutely they did. Because they knew it in conjunction with what? The Passover. You know who doesn't know the Passover very well? The American church. Because we have reduced it down to simply a little event involving a bunny and eggs. How you get a bunny out of Easter, I simply don't know. Are you feeling me? So, so, so they knew this. So let's keep going. He says, behold, your king is coming to you. He is gentle and riding on a donkey. Where do we find that at? Write it down. Isaiah 62 is one place. Zechariah 62 and 11. I'm sorry. My apologies. And Zechariah 9 and 9. So they knew the word, did they not? They knew it. They knew he was coming. The problem was he did not look like they wanted him to look. Can I, can I, can I just interject this little bit of my own thought here by the Holy Ghost? They know who you are. You just don't look like they want you to look. They know that you're anointed. And there's something peculiar about you that they really can't tap into. But they know that they don't see. See, when, when, when oh, God, help me. When you, when you come around, the cursing seems to die down a little bit. When you come around and they don't know what to say, they try to, they try to manage their language because there's something about you. They can't put their finger on it, but they know that there's something about you. And they did the same thing with Jesus. So you don't, you don't think it's strange. It's just part of who you are. All right, let me keep going. What verse I leave you at? Six. Six? Okay. So he says here, uh, so the followers or the disciples went and did what Jesus told them to do. In other words, they went and, went, went and got the donkey. They brought the donkey, verse seven, and the colt to Jesus and laid their coats on them. And Jesus sat on them. Verse eight, many people or a very large crowd spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Excuse me. The people were walking ahead of Jesus and behind, following him, shouting. Say shouting. shouting. In other words, they weren't quiet. He comes in and they start shouting, Hosanna. Right? Right? A Hebrew, which is a Hebrew word which is used for help. But by this time, it is, it, they've turned it into a praise. He says, Hosanna to the Son of God, which is a title for the what? Messiah. In other words, they know what they've learned. Can I, can, please stay with me. In, in their own Hebraic Sunday school. From the Talmud and, 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 and all of the things that they've learned through the teaching of Moses, you know. Uh, they've learned that the Messiah is going to come and, and the time of his coming is going to be around the time of the Passover. So, but just because they know that doesn't mean their hearts were prepared for it. He says, God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118 and 26. Praise to God in heaven. Verse 10, I'm a, that's where I'm going to end this one. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, all the city was filled with excitement, stirred up in an uproar. The people asked, who is this man? <laughs> the crowd said, verse 11, this man is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And yet when they said it, by their own announcement or pronouncement of it, they condemned themselves because they did not know that he was the Messiah because they saw him as just somebody from Nazareth of Galilee. Where are you from? I'm from Romulus, New York, born in Geneva, New York. How many of y'all been to Geneva, New York, by show of hands? How many of y'all been to Romulus, New York, by show of hands? You feeling me? Many of them had not even been to Nazareth in Galilee, but they knew that that's where he was from. So rather than looking for the Messiah, they were looking for the prophet. Not to mess your spirituality up, not trying to infer anything, but there is a difference in the, in the prophet and the Messiah. 
There's a difference in the fivefold minister and Jesus. There should not be a significant difference in the two, but many times the apostle and the prophet and the teacher and evangelist and pastor do not necessarily have the voice of the master. And if, if, if they don't really bring Jesus to you, I doubt seriously whether or not they really are from God. We have people that sit in our churches. I'd like to exclude Life Point. Can I exclude Life Point? We have people that sit in our churches that say they love Jesus, but don't even know him. Couldn't recognize him if he came up and thunked him in the head. That's not condemnation, that's ignorance. And, and so my, my point, and, and as, I, as I move down through this, I want you to see that Jesus did not avoid even those people that did not know him. He didn't say, don't throw that, don't, don't throw down the palm leaf. Don't do that. He got on the donkey, and, his, and, and, and listen to me, as equally... <laughs> as equal, equally triumphant as he was, he was equally not moved. Because uh, being on the donkey was not a sign of victory. God help me. It was not a confirmation as much as it was a fulfillment of the word of God that had already been spoken about how he had to live the last week of his life. So in other words, he sends them to the city and says, go get the donkey, go get the foal one, or colt, bring them to me. And he doesn't say, no, 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 that's not good enough for me. He says, thank you very much, as it were. They drape their clothes across. He sits down because the scriptures must be fulfilled in his lifetime. And the same thing is true about you and I. It, it, it is a dangerous thing. Give me my rag, please. It, it, it's, in my, it's in the outside fold here that side right there it is a dangerous thing not to know the scriptures god help me this morning because in knowing the scriptures you know thank you you know what god has already said about you to not know the scriptures is to live a life of of of, of under fulfilled uh, uh passions dreams and, and 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 wishes and prayers because ultimately what happens is if i can't identify my existence in the scriptures i am really here for nothing somebody else i ain't never been to church like this i know neither have i that's not bragging i'm just telling you the truth so 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 what is happening what day did I, did I leave you on tuesday or did i leave you on monday i left you on monday Okay, so, so let's, let's, let's keep going. Go down to verse 10. We're going to read 10 and 11. I think I already read it, didn't I? Okay, okay, let's go down to, let's go to the next part. So he visits the temple here, and something significant happens. And then he returns back to Bethany. Okay? Now, the significance of this is when he returns back to Bethany at the date that he returns, or the day that he returns, which we would commonly call Monday. So you wonder what Jesus was doing on Monday? I'm telling you. He's doing this. This is the day that the Passover lambs are being selected. They're being, they're being picked. Now, what was the significance of the Passover lamb? Somebody tell me real quick. What was important about it? That it had no blemish, no spot, no deformity, right? So, so in other words, listen. So, God, help me. So, in other words, what's happening in the natural mirrors what God is doing in the supernatural. So, in other words, they're picking, getting ready to pick the lambs, and God's lamb is already coming to the city. He, and then listen, listen, he has to come, God, he has to come at the same exact time that they are picking the lambs of sacrifice. Because in the natural, they are looking for the right one. Help me. You ever look for the right one, the right thing? You're looking, you're examining, and, you know, I mean, I'm just speaking as a guy. When I look at a woman, I'm looking at the woman that I'm, you know, especially when I'm still choosing. I've already chosen, so y'all feeling me, right? So I made my choice. I ain't looking no more. I found the one that, that, oh, God, help me, that helps me find what I'm looking for. It has to be without spot and without blemish. And doesn't mean that they don't have some type of issue that I can't see, but I'm only looking at what I can see based on what God has given me according to the scriptures and now Jesus has come and he enters in and all of heaven is watching his entrance and the religious leaders are supposed to be seeing that 
the lamb has entered into the city. But because they are blinded by their religion, they cannot even determine and recognize that the Messiah, God help me, the lamb that the Bible has already declared was slain before the foundation of the earth, just walk back into town. So, so, so they enter into Jerusalem. So what I, what I, what I, what I take you at? What's the last one? All right. Let's, let's go to, let's go to, uh, just skip down to verse 18 here. Okay. So he comes in, he enters in Jerusalem and he presents himself. He presents himself as the Pascal or the Passover lamb. Isn't that interesting? So verse 18, if you have a say, amen. Early the next morning, as Jesus was going back to the city, he became hungry. Now, the lamb is hungry. <laughs> God help me. There's such irony there that if I had time, I, the lamb now gets hungry. In other words, in other words, we cannot separate the deity of God from the humanity of God. In, in other words, what, what people, the problem that most people have with, with us, with us, is that they see the package of Kelsey and they think that, well, that's not godly enough for me to receive God through Kelsey. Yeah, anyway. So, so when they look at the lamb of God, he's not fitting their criteria, but the lamb recognizes that he is the lamb is a man, is a man. The lamb is a man. And so because he's human, he still has the necessity to be able to fulfill the human requirements. The Bible doesn't say that he fasted from, the, from day, day seven to day one. Uh, I better stop because... We think that fasting is the right thing to do, but not if the Holy Ghost didn't tell you to do it. Amen. I think I'll fast. To, you need to hear God. Amen. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. So what does he do? Let's, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. So, so uh, he goes down and, and uh, skipping down again to verse 18. He says, early next morning as Jesus was going back to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a fig tree beside the road, Jesus goes to it. But there were no figs. He found nothing on the tree, only leaves. Wait a minute. Write this down. You write it down. Go there later. Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. No, matter of fact, we got to go there. Just hold your Bible. Hold your place right there because I don't want to mess you up, and I want to make sure that we're scripturally accurate so I ain't making this stuff up. Some of y'all might think, where are you getting all this from? From the Bible. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Now I will say, verse 1, uh, Isaiah 5, verse 1. Now I will sing for my friend, beloved, a song about his vineyard, Right. Israel is the vineyard and God is its owner. Y'all know that, right? My friend had a vineyard on a hill with a very rich soil. Verse two, he dug and cleared the field of stones, planted the best grapevines there. He built a tower in the middle of it and out of it a wine press as well. Glory to God. He hoped uh, to see good grapes would grow there, but only bad ones grew. Verse 3, you people living in Jerusalem and you people of Ju Ju Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have already done? Although I expected good grapes to grow, why were there ba only bad or sour ones? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove the hedge and it will be burned. I will break down the stone wall and it will be walked. In other words, Jesus is the fulfillment here. He has taken the, the, the protection that Israel had because of its security with God. They, have, they had turned it into a religious ceremony. And now God says, I had this hedge about you, but because you would not receive it, you were looking for something different. I've got to remove it. But in my removing it, I'm going to give you a lamb that will protect all of Israel, all of the engrafted church, from this day forward. Amen. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. I hope, am I boring y'all? I hope I'm not. He, he, he says here, he says here, let me keep going. Verse, verse 18, 19. Glory to God. So Jesus said to the tree, you will never again have fruit. The tree immediately dried up. Now, with that being said, with that being said, Help me now. Somebody help me. I'm, I'm just a pole. Uh, 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 I got to watch my words here. I, I, I'm just a country boy who, who never went to seminary, who never had an inkling or unction for the things of God until God arrested his heart. But I, I see something here that I don't understand. I don't understand. So you help me. Why would Jesus curse a tree 
that had leaves, a fig tree, but no fruit. Why would he curse it? Why, 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 what, what benefit is there to curse the tree? It's already not producing. It's already barren other than leaves. And, and yet there is something supernatural going on behind the scenes because he's on this, listen, he's, he's on this final entrance to his preparation for his death. So, so, so Jesus, I believe, you can dispute me and tell me if I'm wrong if you want to, that's fine, just show me from scripture. But I believe, I believe, but I believe that the tree had been pre-positioned by God to be there for the necessity of the lamb. It speaks to God, we, talk, we commonly call him Jehovah Jireh. It speaks to who God is in essence. In other words, there are things that have supernaturally been placed in, in, in the path of your fulfillment of your life that if you just keep walking, you will encounter things that you did not even know were there. Yeah, I get there's more amens coming from this side and that side. So, 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 so what happens here in, my, in, my, in what I see with the Lord is that the tree is there. But somehow or another, the tree has become corrupt because of what has been going on around it. The, the soil of the tree has been poisoned. It has enough oomph and enough moxie and enough stamina to produce leaves, but there's not enough strength in it to, to fulfill its purpose. God, help me in this place. Many of us, as the plant, the Bible says that we are the righteousness of God, a planting of the Lord. We are trees of righteousness. Can I get a better amen than that? We have been built up and, and planted in the soil of God's kingdom in the earth, and we can't just allow ourselves to produce leaves, baby. We got to produce some fruit up in here and we can't allow the contaminants of the soil of our life to cause us to come up short what, what are some of the most disappointing words that Jesus is going to speak to people listen to Christians not many people think that's unbelievers at the end time depart from me I don't even know who you are and you say but Lord I'm a tree I am, a, I am a righteous planting. And the Lord said, well, where, where, where's your fruit? I, 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 I was driving here this morning. I drove and dropped my wife on and came back. And I thought about this. Jesus Christ is the most vilified, the most objectified, the most uh, disparaged, and yet the most deified name known to man you name me one person just one only one that tried to enter my mind and I know this is from the enemy was Hitler but Hitler didn't have don't have didn't have nowhere near the, 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 the recognition of somebody who has done so much other than evil Jesus did nothing but good but was accused of doing evil and, and when you want to get into a dispute of the age, if you want to really get into somebody who decides that they don't want to hear what you say, tell them about Jesus. Take it to the workplace. Take it somewhere where it is off limits to talk about Jesus and you watch how they come against you. Don't you dare. They told the disciples in the, in the, in the New Testament, you can do anything, but you cannot speak in the name of Jesus. Isn't that right? And so this, this Jesus man, he is, the, he, is the, he is the epitome of all things God. And in the process of being all things God, he walks up on a little bitty fig tree. <laughs> I, I've said this before in messages I preached about the fig tree. I bet you that fig, fig tree is like produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit. Produce. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But it was too late when Jesus walked up on it. He should have, that fig tree should have been doing that like what, six months ago. Now we laugh. We laugh about the fig tree. But we won't be laughing at our own lives. We won't be laughing when we had an opportunity to tell one extra person or just tell this one, well, they don't like me. So listen, they don't care about the fig tree, but it don't matter. Your purpose, the purpose of the fig tree was to produce fruit. And so was ours. You got that. Amen. Let's keep going. Can I go a little bit longer? Is that all right? I'm certainly not going to finish all this, but that's okay. I want to get as far as I can into this. It's going to be resurrection next week. <laughs> 
Glory to God. So, so go, go with me to, uh, I'm going to skip down a little bit. Glory to God. Go with me, turn with me to uh, Mark 11. Mark 11. One book over, one book over, one book over. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I ain't even look back at my clock. How much time I got? I have busted that clock all up. Amen. Mark 11, uh, verse 18. Mark 11, 18. You got it? Say amen. I get done quick if y'all listen faster. Amen. <laughs> amen. Still ain't funny. And many times I say, yeah, I ain't. Whatever. <laughs> the leading priests and the teachers of the law heard all this and began trying to find a way to kill Jesus. Why are you going to kill him? He's just one man. They were afraid of him. Because all the people were amazed at his teaching. That evening, listen, Jesus and his followers left the city. Why did they leave the city? Because there were final preparations to be made. So when we look at and examine where he's at now, you know, on, on our, he's now really, he's actually on Tuesday, right? So let's, let's keep, I'm going to keep going. Just, I'm going to speed through. I know I get a little excited. Y'all have to understand. That's just the way I'm. Let's move into Wednesday for a minute. Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. How many days is Wednesday from Sunday? Four? Four days now. Four days. We're four days out. Now let's go back to what I said in the very beginning. Look up at me. You're four days away from dying, and you know it. Nobody can turn the hands of the clock, not even you. It's a given. And in Jesus' case, we, it'd be nice to think that he was so spiritual that he was excited about it. The Bible also says that Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, listen to me well now, this, is, this will help somebody. Joy and excitement are two different things. There's some things that happen in your life that might be exciting, but there's no joy associated with it. You need to be careful when you start falling into that realm. It's exciting to go out here and win money down at Riverside. It's exciting to go up and drop a liner on a girl and, and next thing you know, you in bed with her. Yeah, I ain't saying nothing in this Holy Ghost church. It's exciting to go out here and eat all the meal, all everything they got on the buffet. But there ain't going to be much joy when you get done. <laughs> so Jesus is excited, but it's not the excitement that causes him, it's the joy. So he knows that his time is coming. So here, <clears throat> here we are, excuse me, on Wednesday. The Bible says on the way to Jerusalem, the disciples saw the withered fig tree, right? We talked about that. Matthew, you just write it down. I'm going to go back there. Mark 11, 20 and 25. That afternoon, excuse me, at the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus' authority and wisdom was questioned by some religious leaders. In other words, they plotted to kill him, did they not? Because they started seeing that people were, people, look, this thing was working. Yeah. It was working. He's already gone to the home of Simon the leper. Wait a minute, we're not even supposed to be around lepers, right? Isn't that what the law taught? Come on, y'all. Yeah. What is the leper supposed to do when they walk out in society? Unclean. We have no concept of that in our current day society. Unclean. And they were required to walk and wear a certain garment and to walk. And when people were around, they were required to keep a certain distance between them and the people if they were in public at all. And the only reason why they would be in public, it was an absolute necessity because to be in public meant, to, meant the possibility of being stoned. And these are people that are untouchables. That's where that term comes from. They were not touchable. They were not approachable. And Jesus walks right up to them. I'm coming to your house tonight, buddy. Shot them. They were shocked. What would happen with a church of people that walked right into the most contemptible and vile of places? I'm scared of them drug addicts on east side. That's where you need to be. Oh, I, I got a few. I, I better stay here. I, I, I don't want to go around them because they drink too much. That's right where you need to be. Amen. Yeah. I'll come back over when y'all say amen. Hey, hey, I don't want to be around her because she a hoe and he's a, he's a, he's a, what is he? Uh, did they say, did they really say pimp in church? <laughs> what are you? The, ch the church has resisted, resisted approaching people who don't fit their little square box. Resisted them. I don't care what y'all say. 
I know good and well. Y'all go in some churches and they look funny at y'all because y'all there. I ain't talking about color or sex. It don't matter. There's something oozing out of you called the anointing of the Holy Ghost that when you walk in, uh uh-oh, I'm one of those. Mm. So that's what they did with Jesus. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. So so here he is on on Monday. So he's gone that uh, Tuesday. He's come back in and they're trying to kill him. That evening, the Bible says Jesus left Jerusalem. Jerusalem returning as, as, it, as it appears back to Bethany. Let's go to Wednesday. On Wednesday, on the way to Jerusalem, the disciples saw the withering fig tree at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus' authority and wisdom was questioned by some religious leaders. That afternoon, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, delivered his dis- discourse to them that were assembled. Let's take a look, real quick look at that scripture at Matthew 24. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Many of you know it. Matthew 24 is one of the most, it, it, well, forgive me, Father, is the most prophetic book in the Bible as spoken by Jesus himself. And what he does, what it speaks to is he does not leave them comfortless. In other words, he has the he doesn't he doesn't get upset because they were trying to kill him. He simply stays focused on his purpose and says, you know what? This is what's going to happen at the end of the age. And people are listening. People are paying attention. Some people just like people in church, some people fall asleep. Not life point, but you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like, it's like, uh, uh, this is, this really isn't in my notes, but I'm going to use this. Psalm 23, you know, Psalm 23, we talked about this. We talked about it many times. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, right? And, 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 you know, folks will come to church or they'll be in church or in a church. I'm just going to say life point because that's all I know. They'll be in church and one person will be eating and say, mm, that's good. Mm, that's good. Mm, that's good. Some folks say, well, I I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't eat that. And you know what? The p- table is spread out before you. It's up to you what you take and don't take. Amen. And this is what happened with Jesus in, in, Matthew, in, in Matthew 24. I'm not going to read it. You, you write it down for yourself, okay? Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus begins to just lay out his heart and talk to them about the plan of God and what they can look for in terms of what's going to happen, what's coming down the road. Can you say amen to that? Okay, so let's go on. What day did I leave you at? Did I, did I take you to... What day? Wednesday? Okay, Thursday, Thursday here, he's here, um, he, his disciples are now preparing the Passover lamb. Yes, Lord, I hear you. That's a good way, that's a, that's a good way to bring this thing on into a close. Okay, so we're at Thursday now. Thursday, I want you to turn with me real quick, real quick, real quick to uh, Matthew 26. Turn to Matthew 26. Can you do that? Matthew 26, please. Matthew 26. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. Matthew 26, verse uh, 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is the feast that preceded it, right? The followers or the disciples came to Jesus. They said, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? <laughs> I'm going to read it for you in a second. But what was the Passover meal? The lamb. The lamb but what else was it? What was it called? No, not the Last Supper. It was, but not, not something I'm reaching for. What was it? It was a Seder. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Why are we doing this on Friday? Thank you for your response on that. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing this because we as a church are, are I, am, I am commanded by God to make sure that I bring our church into alignment with what is going on in Jerusalem, in Israel, and with the heart of God for what things will look like in the final day. Amen. You cannot come to this church and not know about Israel. If, if you do, and I don't teach on it, then I'm at fault. Yes. Whether you like it or not, well, I don't... I'm, I shouldn't say this, <laughs> but I will, yeah. You know, to be anti-Semitic is to be just flat out ignorant. I believe, now if you're Christian and anti-Semitic, you ain't Christian. You ain't. I did say A-I-N-T, right? You ain't. I didn't say are not. You are not a Christian. You ain't a Christian. Because to be against those that God loves is to be against God's heart. Oh, God. I'm going to say this to the YouTube audience because I know everybody here gets this. 
If you out there, and I don't care, I'm not concerned and scared about how you react to what I teach and what I preach. That, ain't, that doesn't even bother me at all. I'm going to tell you, if you're anti-Semitic you and, and, and do not repent and give your heart to God and you die as an anti-Semite, you will face the fiercest, fiercest powers of hell when you die. I don't know. Y'all might as well pull him in because I told you. I don't know what happened with Hitler. He, he might have he might have repented. I don't know. But if he didn't. Wow. Homeboy is burning and burning in a place that is only reserved for those who are the fiercest opponents of God. Let me keep, I better keep going because I had y'all till that. But OK, OK, OK. All right. Ten minutes and I'm done. Ten minutes. Somebody count me, count me down. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Give me ten minutes. <clears throat> OK, OK. Now. So this is what happens on Thursday. So Jesus shares his, his words with his disciples. He begins to pray for them. Uh, you can, you can uh, write this down. It's uh, Matthew 26, 20 through 30, and Matthew 30, 26, 30 through 35. All in the same, same, same area, okay? So he's beginning to do this. They arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane. Ah, oh, okay, this is where we begin to, begin to culminate, right? They arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus suffers in agony awaiting what was to come. Right now, later that night, something took place. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. Turn with me to Matthew 26, verse 46. Should be like right where you are or a page over. You have it? 26, verse 46. And just stay with me now. I'm going to read this from the expanded Bible so I can let you go. It says here, glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me start at verse 45. Then Jesus went back to his followers and said, are you still sleeping and resting? The time has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to the sinful people. Get up. We must go. Look here. Look. Here comes the man who has turned against me. Who is that man? Judas. Judas. Verse 47. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12 apostles. Mm, you mean one of his own people? His inner circle? Yep. Came up. With him were many people carrying swords and clubs who had been sent from the leading priests or the chief priests, and the Jewish elders of the people. Judas had planned to give them a signal saying, the man that I kiss is Jesus. Arrest him. Verse 49, at once Judas went to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, or teacher, and kissed him. Verse 50, Jesus answered, what? Friend. Friend. Oh, please don't miss that. Friend, do what you came to do. Then we go on and understand that, that he was captured and, and, and taken. Now, of course, Peter, in the meantime, decides he wants to cut somebody's ear off. And Jesus corrects him and says, listen, you can't do what my father has not called you to do. And he has not called you to do to take your sword out. Let's keep going. Let's move into Friday. Early in the morning, Jesus was tried by the Sanhedrin. Pilate, Herod, and Typhus, and Pilate again. Verse 20, uh, 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 the next one, 22, is Matthew 26. You don't have to, I mean, Matthew 27, 1 through 30. Write it down. Matthew 27, 1 through 30. I'm not going to go there. He was led to the cross and crucified, this is where I want to get to, at 9 a.m. Precisely, without a clock, without a, uh, what's, what's the, I know there's a doomsday clock, but what's the, um, what's the clock? No, 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 no. Well, that's what they would have had back then. But the clock that we use that's precise uh, in, in our society. Huh? Who said it? Atomic. Atomic clock. Yes, thank you. Without, without the benefit of that, can I ask you a question? At any time, close your Bibles, close your Bibles, because I, I, I got to get done. At any time, does Jesus resist his accusers? At any time, does he back off? At any time, does Jesus, does Jesus, listen, at any time, does Jesus say that he's the son of God? Doesn't have to. Rather, what they do when they bring him before, be, before his accusers and the chief priests, and you know the rest of the story, they begin slapping him, some spit on him, his face, because they felt like he was being, you know, uh, rude, 
insubordinate, which he was, but he was just being who he was. He wasn't coming out being that. And they say to him, are you the king of the Jews? Right? What does he say? You said it. By mere fact that it came out of your mouth, the mere thought that you had in your thinking, listen, somebody had to be the king of the Jews. God help me this morning. And in that somebody, that somebody who walked through the garden from Bethany back to Bethpage, back to Bethany, walks into the garden of Gethsemane, walks in there, gets on his face, submitted to God. The Bible says that he prayed, as it were, and drops of blood began to. And there's a medical condition that coincides with that. Not that he was sick, but it was literal drops of blood that began to that he began to perspire. Then when he gets up, he goes to his partners and say, what y'all sleeping again? My God, y'all need to go to bed earlier. He goes back to prayer and then one of his friends comes and begins the process, help me, the process of his necessity to die. In other words, he cannot die except he allow his life to be taken. You couldn't kill him. You could have shot him with a bow and arrow and it wouldn't have killed him. I dare say that they could have raised the sword to try to cut off his head. And, you know, I mean, you think what you want. Either the sword wasn't going to hit him, which is probably more accurate because he just moved. And then they can't find him no more. Or the sword would just break as it came. But when it came time to die, when, 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 when Friday comes around and Friday is the day that all things must culminate in the plan of God, when he steps up to his accusers and is seated there in the court of the Sanhedrin and the religious council, he doesn't have to say anything because everything that needs to be said has already been said. Heaven is watching the discourse and the display and the ceremonialism of what's going on. The demons in hell are rejoicing now. They're thinking, we got him now. All of the time they tried to catch him, they plotted to kill him. They tried to trap him and they couldn't keep him. Man, when, when, when they tried to gather about his feet, the next thing the Lord was just, he was over in another city. Because you can't kill the one who has already been killed before the foundation of the world. He's there now, and he doesn't resist. My God, he's not moving. The Bible says that he was, he was led as a, as a lamb, dumb before his shearers. In other words, he's standing there saying, okay. What do they say about you and I? Oh, pastor, they talking ugly about me. Welcome to the club. That's what they're supposed to do. If everybody's your boy, your friend, you ain't living nothing. <laughs> Demons are salivating, as it were. You know, I'm trying to get that Hollywood picture out of my thinking, but, you know, fangs and you know, hissing, because and, and, it's more vile and contemptible than that. There is a stench that simply cannot be tolerated by the humanity of our, of our bodies. And all the time, they're just writhing and writhing, trying to get their, their if they can be the one to, to try to grasp and latch hold. Now, they tried to do it, and Jesus, went in, when he met up with the madman of Gadara, or the man at the tomb, he said, you know, he asked him a name and said, what is your name? Our name is Legion. The, 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 the demon had to answer. Then he encounters one demon and says, please, please don't touch me before the time. Now they're ready for him to come. And so, so on Friday, all of these things are going on. The city begins to have a stir and a buzz, and it starts to grow ominous, and you begin to feel a palpable pulse to the city, and it doesn't feel good. And everybody that doesn't know Jesus and is not a disciple is now all of a sudden inclined to fear and trepidation. They're not sure what's going to happen, but those that know him, they're on their face before the master. They're down praying and interceding. Jesus has been taken. Now let's pray. And they're praying and they're praying and they're praying, but yet their prayers do not stop the move of God because the move of God has been ordained before the foundation of the world. Baby, you can't stop what God is doing, not even in Iowa City, Iowa. You can't stop it. I don't care what the...
they raise against you. I don't care what they say about you. As long as you stay the course. Because the same one that sat there as a lamb and who died. The Bible lets us know that when he died, he went down and he had to be tormented by the enemies of his God and his father. But in the midst of being tormented, God said, that's enough. Bible says that he stripped them of their of their power he took captivity captive and brought them up and and clearly the Bible says that in the book of Acts that when he came up out of the tomb he was seen by more than 500 people here we are in the 21st century where people try to dis, dismiss the deity of God. The Bible, what scripture says that so what if men don't believe? Does it make the promise of God of none effect? 1 Corinthians 15 says that, says that if, if Christ be not risen. And, 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 the, and the tactic of the enemy today is to somehow cause you and I to think that because we are 21 centuries, as it were, removed from his death, that somehow or another we don't have the same power. But the devil is a liar. I'm out of time. Not out of words. I'm out of time. Come on, lift your hands in the presence of God. Oh, God, help us this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yes, he is risen, baby. Yes. He is risen indeed. Party took place in hell on Saturday, as it were, the Sabbath. Carousing and every little everything that you could think of evil, every spirit, every spirit that could be there at that convention, I'm calling it that, at that convention of the demonic was there rejoicing because the Son of God had been made to be brought low into the grave. And so they danced around his grave. They looked and said, ha ha! Look at the Son of God now. And Jesus is silent in the tomb. He's quiet, not, not because there's a lack of words, but the time of his speaking has not come yet. God help me. And when the time comes and the heavenly courts of justice and righteousness but drop the gavel of his word, the God the Father's word, all of a sudden the world begins to shake on its axis. Yeah. Hallelujah. Trembling is now heard in the regions of the damned. And the regions of righteousness in the heavenly realm start rejoicing because the party is on now, baby. Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, angels are rejoicing. The winged creatures are rejoicing. Yeah. My God, all of the host of heaven has bowed down that the Lamb of God is finally released from where he was captive. He doesn't just, just, he doesn't just go to heaven. <laughs> he stands at the brink of humanity and eternity. And he makes sure that his disciples know that I am he. God help me. If I promise you that I will be with you until the end of the age, don't you doubt because I'm not going anywhere. Where I sit now is a better place for you. And when I get there on the heavenly mercy seat and sit next to the Father, I will send you another comforter. Just wait on the promise of the Father. And the comforter comes, my God, in the presence of Holy Spirit. And he begins to empower every last one of us to do the works of Jesus in the earth. And the devil tries to shut us up and make us doubt that God is real. He's more real today by testimony of you and I being here in his name. Woo, Jesus, I'm excited in this place. My God. But pastor, I don't see it. Don't stop. Just keep going. Don't quit now, baby. Don't stop now. Just show up. Just get up in the morning and pronounce that the same power of God that was upon Jesus is upon me. Hallelujah. My God. And I'm telling you what, baby. I'm telling you. The time is coming. As this thing begins to crescendo and wrap on up 
as the power of God begins to transcend time and distance in the age of the church, the church and all of the glory that God said it would have is beginning to show up in the least likely of places. It's starting to show up in a place in Nebraska, in a place way down in Mexico, in a place way over in Cuba, my God, where they don't even, can't even call on the name of Jesus. It's showing up in Iowa. Because people are learning that I recognize that who I am, I am by the power of God. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Master. Come on, lift your hands in the presence of God. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord. So what he did on Friday was rest. Help me, Lord. He rested in the promise of the Father. What he did on Saturday, Monday through Saturday, he rested in the promise of the Father. That great glorious day that we call resurrection, the reason why we celebrate is not because we saw it, but because we believe it. I celebrate that which I cannot see. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, 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 you know, I'm believing in healing, but I can't see it. If you wait till you see it, you'll never dance. If you wait till you see it, you'll never lift up holy hands. If you wait till you see it, you'll never open your mouth. But if you can believe, God help me. Jesus said that blessed are they that who have not seen but yet believe. I believe it. Wouldn't bother me at all if he came before we got to to tomorrow. Wouldn't bother me at all. You wouldn't think twice unless you wasn't going. Then you would have something to think about. But that's not you. Father, today in the name of Jesus, I extend the the, 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 the scepter of your righteousness to those that don't believe. There are many that don't believe, Father, but it does not turn your righteousness or the power of God to none effect. Jesus Would you, by your Holy Spirit, walk right now and touch everybody, please? We invite you to do that. Angels of the Lord, maintain the protective barrier, the garrison about this place. Set a hedge of protection about their lives, their families, by the authority of God. We can say that. We can declare it because it's already been declared by your word. My Father, I praise you for healing your people. I praise you for changing their minds about who they are. I come against any inferiority complex in this place today because of that which is done by a parent or a relative or even a friend, suppose quote unquote friend of the family. Those known and unknown that have abused us, caused us to walk in places that have been dry for too long now we're reaching into the realm of the Spirit of God, reaching in with looking for life, lavish love, and the watering of the Holy Ghost. I repent for thinking evil and rendering evil for evil. I release myself from all captivity of the enemy. No more bars surrounding me. I am free indeed. I speak life to minds that are weary, lives that are less than fulfilled I come against emotional abuse mental deficiency I come against it now by the blood and the authority of the Lamb of God we were all once spiritual lepers and yet Christ died for us I receive restoration come on now I don't know what it is you need to be restored from this morning I know you do though Even if all is well, even if all is well this morning, it wasn't once always well. And so those of you that have been fully restored, there's more to accomplish, more to do, but you need to make sure that you're telling somebody else how you got there. How did your marriage turn around? How did you come to a place of power with God and trust in the Holy Ghost? How did you come to a place of believing that what you hear is from God and not just your own mind? Stop waiting on the pastors to tell them or the leaders to tell them. You tell them. 
Tell them that if you just don't quit, God will turn it around. If you don't stop believing in him, God is there every step of the journey. Tell them, tell them, don't stop speaking God's word. It shall come to pass. Shall not return unto him void. Some of you are setting courses in your lives that you never set before. It's been tough. It's been tough to come up to living the standard of righteousness. You can't just live loosely anymore. And it's been tough, but this is what you needed. Not just from me, but from the Holy Ghost. You need spiritual toughness, stamina. Straighten out your back, raise your shoulders, lift your head, and look unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Open ye heavenly gates, and the King shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty. The Lord God, mighty in battle, taking residence at your house in Letts, in North, North Liberty, in Corville, in Tiffin, Oxford, Amana, Newton, wherever you're from, he's there. He wants to show forth his glory. You just got to be the one he uses to do it. Join hands with somebody this morning as we dismiss. Is there anything else we need to do? I don't think so. There's a meeting right after. I got to get you out of here. Father, in the name of Jesus. Come on, Randy, play. The hand that I hold, not only are they a miracle, I don't even know what they've been through, but I know they would not be seated here today if it had not been for the miracle of Jesus Christ in their lives. Father, I thank you not only that they are a miracle, I pray and declare that they need a miracle. Some of us need miraculous financial impartation. Some of us need miraculous emotional healing. Some of us need miraculous restoration in our marriages. Our children, God, seem lost. We need you, God. And we put a demand on the King of Kings, on the power of heaven, just like Jesus did. We lift our voice in praise and adoration to you. We shut down the voice of the enemy that will complain because things are hard and things are tough and things don't, we don't like it. Shut up in Jesus' name. Turn your mourning into joy. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Oh, King Jesus, we love you. As we prepare our hearts for this upcoming Seder, God, let us have a new understanding that symbolically in the spirit, the angels are inquiring and watching what we do. Preparing for the influx of your great glory coming to the church that's already here and shall increase in the days ahead. I pray God for everyone from the north, south, east, and west that no matter where they've been, no matter what they've come from, and no matter what they must go back to, they go back with a new understanding and enlightenment by your Holy Spirit. You've not hidden anything from them. You've given them all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I pray for them now if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that has never accepted Jesus Christ, I'm not even going to call you up here. If you're foolish enough not to receive Jesus, then you really need a revelation. And I'm not talking ugly about you. I'm telling you that you need Jesus more than you need anything else. Doesn't mean all your problems are going to go away. That's a lie. Many of them will just start because now you're looking at it from a different place. But if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I want you to know now that now is the time. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm not even going to beg you. I'm not going to plead with you. I'm just going to say God is already touching your heart. And you would say that I need Jesus. Come on, everybody say that. I need Jesus. I repent of sin. Jesus is my Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give the Lord a great big round of applause and praise.